Hello everyone, I'm Galactic Pilgrim. I'm a huge Star Citizen fan, super excited backer, and by day, I'm a researcher in evolutionary biology. I've always been into gaming and one of my major hobbies, apart from playing awesome games like Star Citizen, is exploring and visualizing the structure of games in terms of mechanics, trade-offs, and balance. When doing so, I like to use similar approaches to those that I use in my research. In this video, I'm going to present my first guide for Star Citizen. It's an analysis of fighters and an attempt at visualizing their variation. I'm going to assume that you know about Star Citizen. If you don't, then have a look for introductions at the official website, the Star Citizen subreddit, or here on YouTube. Star Citizen is a special game to explore in this way, because at the moment, we only have access to the early alpha stage. This means that not only do we not have all the details on the various mechanics in the game, or even the values, strengths and weaknesses of the different ships, but also that what we do know is almost certain to change going forwards as development progresses. I think it's good to bear that in mind, because things that are revealed or changed in the future are likely to significantly change the results presented in this analysis. Nevertheless, the broad design and direction taken with the ships is likely to remain relatively stable, so it's probably still worth looking at, even at this early stage. In the past, I've made a few guides and analyses for various games, and they all follow a specific style, a more quantitative approach to presenting variation in characters or vessels in the game to serve as a foundation for a qualitative interpretation. I'm not interested in telling you how to play or deciding which ship to get. In other words, I'm not going to conduct the sort of analysis that ultimately tells you what's best. In my view, those sorts of guides only really work on games that are quite straightforward, or where there's a limited number of viable strategies and choices. I enjoy games that are detailed and varied, and in which the complexities emerging from this variation generate a rich number of different approaches or tactics that all perform differently depending on the context in game or on the player. That's why I'm never going to say this ship is the best fighter, or that ship is a pile of trash, I'm much more interested in presenting some form of objective variation and then sharing in the discussion, interpretation and evaluation of this variation together with the community. So that is my aim with this analysis, to provide an overview of the variation of the fighters in Star Citizen. I'm going to start by explaining what kind of analysis this will be, and then how I've gone about conducting it. Then I'm going to graphically present it and analyze it according to the ship classifications of CIG, the developers. Secondly, I'm going to briefly walk through the different ships and mention some of their key characteristics or features. And then finally, I'm going to present a slightly different classification system that hopefully will help make more sense of the variation among these fighter ships and provide an easily understandable overview of how they differ. Now at this point in the presentation, there should be some hot links in the video in case you'd like to skip to any of these parts. I'm going to explain my approach as I go along, so that you'll know how I reach the results I do and where we differ in our analysis if you find yourself disagreeing. A final thing to bear in mind is that dogfighting, although one of the few long-term activities at which players engage in the game at the moment, is by no means the defining aspect of Star Citizen. Ships that compare unfavorably in terms of their strength as a fighter may have other strengths which are not included in this analysis. So remember, I'm only going to be looking at fighters, and I'm only going to be assessing their relative strengths in terms of this role. So before starting, we have to select which ship should be included. I've taken fighter to mean the kind of small, and by that I mean single-seater or single-seater plus turret seat, dogfighting ship that you'd realistically aim to use primarily in combat against other similarly sized ships. I've included the three starter ships as well for reference and because many new players will naturally find themselves piloting these vessels at first. Ships like the Constellations and the Cutlasses are of a somewhat different class on account of their size and crew requirements, and I'm looking forward to conducting similar analyses on them separately in the future. To flag a few potentially notable omissions, I've taken only the 325A from Origins 300 series. The other ships in this series are primarily intended for exploration or racing. I haven't included the Gladiator Light Bomber or the Vanguard Harbinger Fighter Bomber, as these are not really focused on dogfighting in the same way as the ships listed here. I couldn't include the Blade or the F8 Lightning, 
as there are no reliable details available for them just yet. I also haven't included the F7CR Hornet Tracker, because it's primarily used as a command and control ship in squadrons, or even for tasks related to exploration, more so than for combat. The ships of Star Citizen differ in many different ways, ranging from their physical dimensions and weight, to their cargo capacity, heat signature, turning radius, computer systems, fuel tanks and so on. This is where the challenge of visualising ship variation comes in. When analysing different types of ships, it's useful to prioritise and focus on certain relevant sets of attributes. For fighters, I'm going to assume that the key areas of interest for potential pilots are firepower, agility and resilience. By firepower I mean the total offensive capabilities of a ship, I say agility, meaning the overall speed and manoeuvrability of a ship, and resilience as a general measure of the toughness or durability of a ship. I'll now walk you through how I go about analysing each of these three areas. Firepower is relatively straightforward to quantify, providing some basic assumptions are made. All ships have their weapon loadouts listed, and so data is available for them all. I score ships based on the total number and size of their available weapon and missile mounts. In other words, I disregard their stock equipment and I focus only on their maximum firepower. I assume for this analysis that weapons and turrets are equivalent. I also assume that the power of weapons with increasing size scales by 1.8 per size. So a size 1 weapon mount, turret or weapon, scores 1. A size 2 scores 1.8. A size 3 scores 3.24 and so on. Likewise, I score missiles similarly. A size 1 missile mount scores 1. A size 2 scores 1.8. A size 3 scores 3.24, just like with weapons, and so on. A ship's total firepower equals the sum of its missile and weapon scores. In order to calculate a firepower score, I create a relative measure based on the other ships in the analysis. First, I calculate the average firepower of all ships in the analysis. I then divide each ship's firepower with the average and subtract 1 to give that ship's firepower score. This means that a ship with firepower exactly equal to the average now has a score of 0, and a ship with half the average now has a score of minus 0.5. A ship with only 20% of the average firepower now has a score of minus 0.8. This firepower score is useful because it centres the variation in firepower among the ships around 0, and scales relative to the ships used in the analysis. This score is thus an aggregate measure of weapon and missile power. Assessing the agility of ships is slightly more involved than looking at the firepower, but still relatively straightforward. The agility is calculated using three of the measures of a ship's flying abilities that are published by CIG for most of the ships that are used in this analysis. For the others, I estimate their agility as discussed later on. The three attributes used are turning speed, turning acceleration and top speed. For the purpose of this analysis, I assign each of these attributes equal importance. I disregard potential effects of outfitting on the resulting manoeuvrability and speed of the ships. To calculate each ship's agility score, I first create relative measures of the three attributes mentioned and then take their mean value. To do this, I calculate the average of all ships turning speed, turning acceleration and top speed. I then divide the value of each of these for each ship with the average and subtract 1. In the same way as firepower, this then creates a relative measure of each of these three attributes. For example, a ship that is 20% faster than the average now has a relative speed score of 1.2, and a ship that turns at 40% the speed of the average ship now has a relative turning speed score of minus 0.6. I then sum these three relative scores and divide by 3 to give that ship's agility score. 
In the same way as with the firepower score, this is useful because it centers the variation in agility around zero, and scales relative to the ships used in the analysis. This agility score is thus an aggregate measure of turning speed, turning acceleration, and top speed. Ideally, I would calculate resilience similarly to the way I calculated agility, as an aggregate score of shield output, armour and some measure of structural integrity or durability. Unfortunately, the only value of these that's currently available from the ship matrix is the shield output, which is easily quantifiable by making a few assumptions. The output of shield generator modules of increasing size is assumed to scale by a factor of 3, as per CIG's design post on ship components. In other words, one medium shield generator is assumed to produce the same strength shield as three small shield generators. I only consider ship's maximum number and maximum size of shield generators, and so disregard their stock or default equipment. Because almost all fighters analysed possess two small shield generators, and no fighters are equipped with any fewer, I set this output to shield score 1. Any ship with more shield generators, or shield generators of greater sizes, will be scored relative this standard score of 1. So a ship with three small shield generators instead of two, for example, will have a shield score of 1.5, as it is producing 50% extra shields. A ship with two medium shield generators will have a shield score of 3, as these medium shield generators are three times as effective as small shield generators, as per the assumption above. A ship with one medium and one small shield generator will have a shield score of two, and so on. The shield score is useful because it expresses a ship's shield output relative to the default and lowest shield output among the ships analysed. I'm going to start by plotting firepower against agility and annotating the ship's names with their shield score. As I mentioned earlier, we sadly don't have any detailed information on the armour or durability of ships just yet, so shield score is going to have to suffice as a rough indication of their resilience, although I will mention a few notes about presumed durability of the ships um, further on in the analysis. So going forward from here, I'll first plot the ships along these axes and group them according to CIG's classification. Then I'll, in short, discuss these results. Then I'll briefly go through the different ships and finally reinterpret the results by classifying them slightly differently. Because remember, the aim of this analysis is not to determine which ship is best, but rather to explore and map their variation and to try and come up with a sensible way of presenting it, so that citizens together can evaluate and interpret the ship's strengths and weaknesses from whichever perspective they are coming from and in whichever context they're interested in. Here is the chart that the ships will be mapped onto. Before adding the ships though, I'll just quickly explain what the results will mean. This chart can be seen as a coordinate system centred around zero along both axes. The x-axis is firepower, ranging from minus 0.8 to positive 1.4. The y-axis is agility, ranging from minus 0.4 to positive 0.4. A score of 0 means that a ship equals the agility or firepower of the average of all ships in the analysis. So a higher position on either axis is a ship that either has more powerful firepower or is more agile than the average ship. Remember that the only available measure of resilience, the shield generator output, will be annotated next to the ship's names. So a score of zero on either axis means that that ship is equally agile or powerful as the average ship of all those included. A ship dead centre in this graph, marked by the central blue circle, is thus a ship that is the perfect average of all ships analysed. The other two circles on this graph represent ships that vary in terms of agility and firepower relative to this average. The upper left ship 
is 10% more agile but has 40% less firepower than the average. The lower right ship is 20% less agile but is 10% more powerful in terms of weaponry. Going into the analysis, you'd expect to uncover some form of trade-off between these two attributes, i.e. agility and firepower. If you were in the top right hand of the graph, you'd be both more powerful and more agile than average, and if you were in the lower left, you'd be both less agile and less powerful, so a gradation somewhat akin to the dotted line here would be expected. But bear in mind, as mentioned earlier, that the ships in Star Citizen differ in many more ways than those analysed for this comparison. This means that deviations from this hypothetical trade-off could also originate in other aspects of the ship. For example, you may indeed find yourself in the lower left corner of the graph, being both less agile and having less firepower than the average ship, but you may also then have a respectable cargo capacity. Equally, you may find yourself in the top right corner of the graph, being both more agile and more powerful than the average ship, but unfortunately also being terribly fragile or hideously expensive. So let's move on and add some ships to this chart. Here you can see the starter ships in green, the light fighters in brown, the medium fighters in orange, the heavy fighters, currently only the Vanguard Warden, to the extreme right, the stealth fighters in purple, and the interdictors, whatever that means precisely, something I'll discuss shortly, in blue. Shield strength is annotated next to the ship's names. You'll remember that 1 equals the standard small ship setup of having two small shield generators. And you'll note that most ships have this setup. Any number larger than that is how many times this output the ship produces. So the Warden, for example, has three times more powerful shields than the standard setup. Specifically in this instance, the Warden achieves this by having two medium shield generators instead of two small. But before discussing these results in any greater detail, I'm going to add six ships where some or all of the data on agility is currently missing from CIG's ship matrix. However, I still think that we can make guesses ranging from educated to relatively wild about their attributes. I'll now add these points and walk through them one by one. The seven ships, not six as I just mistakenly said, added and circled here are those ships for which some or all of the relevant agility attributes are absent from the CIG ship matrix. For this reason, consider their position along the y-axis as somewhat tentative. The Kautu Al, starting in the top left quadrant, has the highest speed of all ships, 20% higher than average. We also know that it has the highest turning acceleration of all these ships, 34% higher than average. However, we don't know its turning speed, but turning speed does tend to scale with turning acceleration among these ships. So therefore we can estimate the agility score of the Kautu Al to be around 0.3, and hence the highest of all ships in the comparison. The Reliant Tana in the bottom left quadrant is, for the sake of this analysis, assumed to handle the same as its base model, the Reliant Core. Likewise, the Vanguard Sentinel and the F7A Hornet are assumed to handle the same as the Vanguard Warden and the Civilian Hornets respectively. I consider the placement of these four ships along the y-axis as relatively accurate. They may shift up or down slightly, but I think these are pretty accurate numbers. The Scythe, Hurricane and Defender are more difficult to place because there are no values at all available for them or for any other variants of these ships. Their position has been determined by examining the flavour texts provided by CIG and what they have posted about them elsewhere, and I will discuss their placement along the y-axis, i.e. Uh, in terms of agility, as I go through the groups shortly. Now remember these groupings are from CIG, and after discussing these results, I will group them differently in a way that hopefully, particularly after I've briefly discussed each ship, will make more sense and be more informative. So let's take a proper look at the structure of this variation. In general, 
All ships have the same standard setup of using two small shield generators, giving the score of 1 in this graph. The exceptions are the Defender, with 50% more powerful shields, the Sabres, with 100% more powerful shields, and the Vanguard's Warden and Sentinel, with 200% more powerful shields. There is somewhat of a correspondence between firepower and agility, such that it is possible to identify a trade-off line of sorts. The trade-off line that you would anticipate between agility and firepower looks something like this. In general, looking at the ships and their descriptions, I imagine this line to also mirror somewhat the overall resilience of the ships, with the stronger ships, or the more durable ships, being towards the right side of this line and the less durable ships towards the left. Straying down and or to the left away from this trade-off line suggests that there's presumably some other trade-off occurring. The best way of working out what that might be is to go through the groups ship by ship. So I'll now go through each group and discuss briefly the ship's placements. Before doing so, I'll just mention the way that ship variants move in the graph. Some variants don't move at all. They differ only in stock equipment, and remember, this graph is based on the maximum loadout size, rather than the default equipment installed at purchase. For this reason, the Gladius Valiant, Sabre Comet, Avenger Renegade, F7CS Hornet Ghost, and Aurora MR are all variants that don't really shift in the graph. The Aurora LN, Mustang Delta, Reliant Tanner, F7C Hornet Wildfire and F7C M Super Hornet all shift to the right in the graph on account of their heavier potential weapon loadouts. The Mustang Delta, for example, has two size 2 weapon mounts instead of the Mustang Alpha's size 1, and it also carries two size 1 missile mounts. These are all examples of variants of ships which have greater firepower than their regular model. The Sabre Raven, Avenger Warlock and Vanguard Sentinel also shift in the graph relative to their other variants, but they move because of their EMP capabilities. While the Sabre Raven and the Vanguard Sentinel sacrifice weapon mounts in order to accommodate their EMP weaponry, the Avenger Warlock simply adds a size 4 weapon mount specifically for its EMP device. This is why the Avenger Warlock scores more highly in terms of firepower than the other Avengers. While it's still not entirely clear how EMP weaponry will function in-game, it does seem to be sufficiently useful so as to warrant significant negative balancing changes to the other weaponry of the more powerful fighters at least. In any case, let's now go through these different ship groups, starting with the Heavy Fighters. The two ships classified by CIG as heavy fighters are the Hurricane and the Vanguard Warden. Both of these ships rely on the use of a manned turret to operate efficiently, but they differ significantly in their approach to combat. The Vanguard Warden is designed as a long-range fighter, and therefore is built such that it can sustain a significant beating and still continue to function. It represents the most extreme trade-off for firepower relative agility among these ships. In terms of resilience, it is likely to be among the sturdier ships, both in terms of what we already know, given its powerful shields, but also in terms of its structural integrity, armour or durability if you will. The Hurricane on the other hand, despite also being a turret equipped heavy fighter, functions very differently. But first of all, to motivate the position I have given it on the agility axis, here is a quote from CIG. The hurricane is faster than it is nimble, designed to rush into trouble, wreck things and then rush back out to regroup. It was designed with speed and hitting power at the cost of durability. So CIG have stated that while it is feasible to take on a light fighter like the Gladius with a hurricane, it is an unnecessary risk and not the intended use of the ship. The hurricane is described by CAG as a glass hammer, meaning, quote, high damage output at the cost of low durability. So it seems that the imagined use of the ship is for it to be a hybrid between light and heavy fighter, 
a small vulnerable chassis packed with more weapons than you would expect. In their Q&A on the ship, CIG were asked what sets the Hurricane apart from other fighters, and they responded, quote, The Hornet is a boxer happy to trade slugs and rely on grit and stamina to be the one left standing. The Buccaneer would prefer to let the opponent take all the beating. The Sabre likes to strike from the shadows. The Gladius likes to chase its prey. Meanwhile, the Hurricane believes that life is short, combat should be shorter, pick a target, eliminate it before it hurts you, and repeat. So all in all, its position in this graph is presumably rather flattering, because its major weakness, its low durability or resilience, is not depicted. It is likely to be a highly vulnerable ship, designed to be more nimble and fast than the heavier fighters that it can outmaneuver, and significantly damage, but not so agile as to be primarily used in combat against lighter fighters. In other words, the Hurricane is designed to harass and threaten heavier ships, or overwhelm lighter ships with its heavy weaponry, all the while utilising its agility to get out of fights that draw on for too long, or to avoid fights against too many medium or light fighters. Here are the first three of CIG's medium fighters, the Scythe, Glaive and F7A Hornet. I have assigned the Scythe its position higher on the agility axis than the other medium fighters based on CIG's description of it. Quote, Featuring a hefty weapons payload, the Scythe's real asset is its maneuverability found in the twin main and twelve maneuvering thrusters. Now the Glaive can be seen as a heavier version of the Scythe. The military version of the Hornet, the F7A, slightly outguns the Glaive. I have assigned the F7A its value on the agility axis, such that it handles similarly to the other Hornets, the civilianized versions. While it may handle somewhat worse due to its heavier weapons, equally it may also feature more military level equipment, and as such I figured it would make sense to assume a roughly similar agility compared to these civilianized Hornets. In short, these are three ships that are built for dogfighting from the ground up, and they represent various positions along the trade-off between firepower and agility. The Glaive and the Hornet are also likely to be somewhat more resilient than the Scythe, based on the flavour text and what CIG has written about them so far. Here are the other three medium fighters. The F7C Hornet is the civilian version of the F7A. In terms of agility and firepower, it comes out as the most average ship in this analysis, i.e. most closely approximating the average scores on both axes, except, excepting of course the special case of the Avenger Warlock, which I will discuss shortly. The F7C Wildfire is a special variant of the F7C, in which a turret replaces the utility hardpoint up top, resulting in a higher firepower score. The F7C M Super Hornet sees a similar change, but it also increases the size of its other guns, as well as manning that turret in this ship, and as such, it requires a second crew member to operate efficiently. These ships are likely to be comparable in terms of resilience, but the Super Hornet will edge out front in this regard. It has been described by CIG as the closest to the military version as is legal on the civilian market, and CIG have dropped comments regarding its durability. These ships deviate from the trade-off line discussed earlier, presumably because they are somewhat cheaper and easier to get hold of than the military-grade medium fighters. Furthermore, they offer some basic versatility in the utility mount of the F7C Hornet, for example. Although still clearly primarily fighters, they are in other words not as dedicated to this task as the completely dedicated military fighter ships, such as the F7A Hornet and the Glaive. Let's now turn to the ships that CIG classifies as light fighters. The Kautu Al is a Shan ship, and exists at the extreme end of the trade-off line depicted earlier, opposite the Vanguard Warden. As mentioned earlier, this is the most agile of the fighters currently available, but also one of the weakest in terms of firepower. Remember also that the ship is not only supposed to be more agile than others, but also 
that it moves in a fundamentally different way, featuring a lot of lateral and vertical strafing movements as its strengths. The Gladius and the Gladius Valiant, meanwhile, differ only in terms of stock equipment, and for this reason they end up in the same position on the graph. They are second in terms of agility only to the Kartu Al. They are positioned as a classic light fighter, with high speed and maneuverability at the expense of firepower. In terms of resilience, they can also be expected to be less durable than heavier fighters. The Banu Defender is an interesting ship on this chart, but before discussing its specific role, I'll start by explaining why I positioned it here on the y-axis, despite its agility attributes being absent from the ship matrix. CIG have stated that, quote, the Defender has an edge in maneuverability over human mainstays like the Super Hornet and Sabre, which themselves have edges in durability and armament, end quote. The Defender is designed with agility in mind, as they are intended to escort slower ships such as the Merchantman and harass intercepting fighters. They are therefore designed with agility as a major strength, and likewise their shield capacity is slightly higher than most regular fighters. As CIG puts it, quote, The Defender's robust shielding, combined with its agility, make it an enduring adversary when piloted well, but in a straight-up brawl, the Sabre and Super Hornet might have the edge. End quote. This also suggests that the Defender, when out of shields, is likely to be less resilient in terms of armour and structural integrity than other fighters. Finally, it's worth mentioning that the Defender also carries tachyon cannons. Whether or not these are specific to this ship alone, and how precisely they function differently to other weaponry is unclear, although CIG have stated that, quote, it is an energy weapon that fires its projectiles at an extremely high velocity, making it both very long-ranged and accurate relative to its peers." End quote. Relative other ships, then, the Defender is a highly competitive fighter, towing the trade-off line between firepower and agility shown earlier, but which pays the price for these strengths with a significantly lower durability or resilience compared to its neighbours in the chart. Also noteworthy about the Defender is that its cockpit seats two crew members, although neither of these are responsible for manning any turrets during combat. Finally, onto the Avengers Titan and Renegade. These ships, like the Gladius and Gladius Valiant, differ only in terms of stock equipment when purchased. They are not classified as fighters by CIG, instead being called light freight although as they are such a community favourite, and as their variants, the Stalker and Warlock, are interesting fighter choices, I have included them in this analysis. As is clear from their position on the graph, the Avengers' firepower is somewhere between that of the Kartu Al and the Gladius, but their agility is no match for these ships. Presumably, they find themselves here in the graph due to their versatile nature. The Avengers Titan and Renegade both have a decent cargo capacity, and as such are not quite as dedicated as fighter as, for example, the Gladius. The Reliant Tanner is the combat-oriented variant of the Reliant Core, the Shan-inspired starter ship designed by MISC. It has received extra weaponry for this role. As it is not a dedicated fighter, it is unsurprising that it compares unfavourably in terms of agility and firepower to most other ships in this analysis. Notably, however, like the Defender, its cockpit houses two seats, and again, neither of the crew members need man turrets during combat. Its poor comparison to the more dedicated fighters hint at the relative strengths of the Reliance series in other areas. Likewise, the Mustang Delta is the combat-oriented variant of the Mustang series. Compared to the basic Mustang Alpha, it features larger weapons and added missile hardpoints. However, due to it still not being designed as a fighter from the ground up, it struggles to compete with the heavier fighters in this analysis. The Aurora MR is almost identical to the Aurora ES in the graph, and in fact differs only in agility owing to its separate stock equipment. In fact, 
the only difference between it and the Aurora ES. The Aurora LN, on the other hand, is significantly more powerful than the ES, with a much expanded set of weaponry. In terms of agility, however, it defines the lower end of the spectrum of variation among fighters. These Aurorae will struggle in combat with the other fighters in the analysis, again hinting at other strengths hidden in this particular comparison, such as for example versatility in terms of customization options, cargo space and low costs. The stealth fighters are a small group of ships focused on cloaking or concealing their presence in order to ambush their targets or quickly disguise themselves in order to retreat from combat. The F-7C S Hornet Ghost is a variant of the F-7C Hornet, the civilianized version of the F-7A Hornet. Identical in terms of agility and firepower to the F-7C, it features added stealth capabilities. The Sabre and the Sabre Comet differ only in terms of stock equipment, not in total weapon mounts or agility. These ships are designed specifically with stealth in mind. As CIG puts it, quote, Compared to the Hornet Ghost, the Sabre is built from the ground up to be a dedicated stealth ship, whereas the Hornet Ghost is retrofitted to become stealthy. Therefore, whilst the Ghost is still very stealthy compared to other ships, it won't be quite as impervious to radar as the Sabre, end quote. In terms of resilience, the Sabre and Comet feature twice as powerful shield output to most fighters. However, in terms of overall durability and integrity, once those shields are gone, the Ghost is the more rugged option. While the Ghost retains the Hornet's signature toughness, CIG state that, quote, the, CIA, the, the Sabre, on the other hand, is not tough. It relies heavily on its ability to not be detected, and then its array shields to keep it safe. Once those shields are down, you'd best be on your way out of combat, else you'll probably not make it back. End quote. So in other words, these three stealth ships differ in their relative resilience and stealthiness, with the Ghost favouring the former, and the Sabre and Sabre Comet favouring the latter. Nevertheless, the Ghost remains a viable option for pilots looking to fly a sneaky ship. The Interdictors are a disparate group of ships owing, I believe, to the as yet unclear mechanics of interdiction. As far as I gather, interdiction is the term used for the process of interrupting another ship's quantum travel. More than just this, however, this group of ships also contains vessels which aim not to destroy, but to incapacitate their opponents. Because interdiction is not fully cleared up just yet, I'll talk about these ships in terms of their position on the graph as well as their particular equipment, rather than attempt any guesswork on how interdiction might work. So to start with, the Sabre Raven is the recently released variant of the Sabre, described as, quote, maintaining all the speed and maneuverability of its Sabre forebear, but with a lower ship signature, making it a fast, stealthy infiltrator, end quote. The Raven can therefore be understood as an even stealthier variant of an already specifically stealthy ship. The reason for its firepower decrease compared to the regular Sabre is presumably related to its added EMP capabilities. The Raven therefore occupies a unique role among fighters, a stealthy EMP fighter. It is presumably to this CIG are referring when they dub it an assassin. Note also the retained shield output, keeping it still significantly more shielded than most fighters. The Avenger Warlock is described by CIG as having been, quote, built towards a single design philosophy, stop ships, don't destroy them. It is therefore, quote, probably the closest to a non-lethal fighter, end quote. In almost all respects, the Warlock is identical to the other Avengers, with the difference being that it is outfitted with a size 4 EMP weapon. The presence of this weapon raises its firepower score considerably, although whether or not this should be seen as a weapon per se is of course debatable. 
In any case, in other regards, it is essentially the same as the other Avengers, other than its slightly worse agility, presumably owing to the weight or power demands of the EMP module. The Vanguard Sentinel is the variant of the Vanguard oriented towards e-warfare. CIG describes it as, quote, a ship that's designed to fight smart instead of taking enemies head on. The conversion features an AR cockpit, an external e-war pod, decoy missiles and a set of EMP charges, end quote. Still a super heavy fighter in terms of weaponry, lack of agility and resilience, the Sentinel is not only a dangerous adversary in terms of firepower. CIG has stated that it is, quote, intended as something of a trickster ship, oriented towards causing confusion on the battlefield. From EMP pulses to command and control interference, the Vanguard Sentinel will support battlefield operations by making it all that much harder for opponents to stay in contact and have proper information. End quote. This is achieved through the more complex AR cockpit mentioned above, as well as the dedicated tactical stations at which an extra crew member can conduct e-warfare operations. However, it is worth noting that the Sentinel, like the Vanguard Warden, requires a crew member to man its turret in order for it to operate at full efficiency. The AR cockpit, for those wondering, is described as, quote, a more complex interface, more akin to the tactical stations found on Star Citizen's capital ships. It's intended to give the Sentinel a broader view of the battlefield, providing the pilot and crew with enhanced information courtesy of their superior sensor array. End quote. For the purposes of this analysis, I have assumed that the Sentinel will perform roughly the same as the Warden in terms of agility. These three ships are all geared towards disabling or incapacitating enemies rather than destroying them. The next three ships in the Interdictor group, however, seem to have earned this classification through different means. The Buccaneer is designed as a rough-and-tumble frontier fighter that can, quote, manoeuvre and fight above its weight class, end quote. While this has become a running joke in the Star Citizen community, in that all ships are said to fight above their weight class, the Buccaneer's position in the graph does show precisely this. CIG have stated that, quote, against larger fighters like the Hornets or Sabre, it should feel more nimble, though with the noted durability drawbacks when lined up against them, end quote. Its firepower is comparable to some of the beefier fighters out there, like the F-7C Hornet and variants, or the Gladius and Sabre, while its agility is bettered only by the Gladii and Cartual. The sacrifice made by the Buccaneer in order to achieve this is its durability. CIG have stated that while the Buccaneer is more heavily armed than, for example, Avengers or the Gladius, it, quote, would be about the same, if not slightly weaker, in durability compared to the F-7C Hornet. They go on to state that it would be definitely less durable than an F-7CM Super Hornet or Sabre. For this reason, its position in the graph should be understood in a similar way as the Defenders. While it does perform well in terms of agility and firepower, its major weakness is not displayed here its low durability or resilience. With regards to why precisely it is considered an interdictor, CIG state that, quote, at the core, its speed, maneuverability and stopping power bring most of the interdiction potential of the Buccaneer. Along with that, we're still developing out the full scope for more equipment-driven interdiction gameplay and how you'll be able to interact with other targets travelling at quantum or jump speeds. Expect more details to come as these systems are fully mapped and ready for implementation." End quote. Now as I mentioned earlier, the mechanics for interdiction are still not clear. However, CIG did go on to state that they are quote, definitely looking into a few other equipment options for the size 4 hardpoint on the Buccaneer, including an interdiction-specific weapon, but at this time those are still more at the napkin idea stage, so we'll need a bit more time to fully develop them out before we can say for certain what options will be available." End quote. 
Whether or not this means that the Buccaneer may have EMP capabilities going forwards is unclear. The 325A is the combat-oriented variant of the 300 series of ships from Origin. It is relatively nimble, though not a terribly heavily armed ship. Its position in the graph presumably suggests it has strengths otherwise, one such being the somewhat abstract sense of value ascribed to its elegance of design. Origin are known for their signature luxurious design choices. CIG mentioned, for example, in defining the Buccaneer, that, quote, compared to something like a 325A, the Buccaneer would be able to deliver a heavier hit, but lacks any of the interior accommodations the 300 series provides, end quote. What precisely this means, and what benefits this may confer, other than a sense of class, is unclear. However, the 325A is also a more versatile ship than many of the other fighters, in having a small cargo hold, for instance. Why it is classed as an interdictor, however, remains unclear. Finally, the Avenger Stalker is the last of the interdictors. The Stalker is simply a variant of the Avenger Titan with prisoner pods installed in the hull, replacing the cargo hold. Why this qualifies them as interdictors is also unclear. It seems perhaps that CIG imagines the taking of prisoners somewhat related to interdiction, although, as mentioned previously, who knows. Finally, the three starter ships occupy the position furthest to the left in the graph, carrying the weakest weapons. While the Mustang Alpha performs the best in terms of agility, and the Aurora ES the worst, this hints towards a different trade-off between durability, or perhaps versatility, in terms of customization options among the starter ships in other respects. I won't go into this in this analysis, however, as I am now only considering their strengths or weaknesses as fighters. And in this respect, the Aurora ES is found to be the significantly weakest and least agile ship. The thing about the starter ships is that they are meant to introduce new players to the games, and so are not designed with a focus on dogfighting, but rather on being capable of engaging in a variety of endeavours depending on customization and context. As mentioned earlier, it's useful to remember that dogfighting is not necessarily the central aspect of the game, and that the qualities of the ships that are quantified here are only those that meaningfully contribute to combat while potential other features are ignored. This concludes the summary of CIG's grouping of ships. While exploring these groups though, examining the results of the analysis and reading up on the ships discussed here, I have identified two broad groupings of ships, the military fighters and the combat-oriented variants of civilian ships. Or in other words, Ships that are adapted or even designed for combat, but which are not dedicated military vessels. A subset of these civilian fighters are the starter ships and their specific combat-oriented variants, which, due to their role as jack-of-all-trades in which new players are to explore the game, are necessarily limited in their strengths as fighters. Within these groups, there are also certain ships with stealth and EMP capabilities. I believe that grouping the fighters according to this structure makes more sense and provides a better overview of the different ships' strengths and weaknesses, which hopefully will help you fellow citizens compare them more meaningfully. So I'll now present the same results, but structured in this slightly different way to hopefully provide this better overview of the ships available. Then, I'll look at a detailed comparison of the ships within these groups, and provide more exact and broken down scores so that you can make an informed and detailed comparison between them. So, similarly as before, the ships will now be plotted with their firepower along the x-axis and their agility along the y-axis, except now the ships will be grouped according to my classification. Just as before, the ship name will be annotated with a shield score, but now I will also add icons for EMP 
and stealth capabilities, as well as flag those ships with notably low durability relative to their position in the graph. My classification divides ships into either military-grade fighters or civilian fighters, and also separates out the starter ships for comparison. The military ships are grouped as either light, medium or heavy fighters for ease of comparison going forwards. The light fighters are brown, the medium fighters orange and the heavy fighters red. The civilian fighters are marked in purple and the starter ships green. The ships that have stealth capabilities are flagged like this. They are the Hornet F7CS Ghost and the Sabre Sabre Comet and Sabre Raven. Now I've also added icons for ships with EMP capabilities. These are the Vanguard Sentinel, Avenger Warlock and Sabre Raven. Finally, ships with a notably weaker frame than their position in the graph would suggest are flagged with this red exclamation mark. They are the Buccaneer and the Defender. The logic behind this classification is based on three root groupings. The first is here, the starters and their variants. These ships are necessarily broad in their intended role, as new players are not necessarily looking for a ship with a laser focus on dogfighting. For this reason, they perform quite poorly in terms of firepower and agility compared to the dedicated fighters. But bear in mind, again, that these ships possess various qualities of, for example, versatility or customization options towards other roles that are not displayed in this graph. The second grouping is that of the civilian ships, which forms somewhat of a trade-off line between those that are slightly more agile and those that are slightly more powerful in terms of firepower. This civilian ship line is however also complicated by the more disparate nature of these ships than the starters or military ships. The 325A, for example, is a combat-oriented variant of the luxurious 300 series of ships. Meanwhile, the F7C is a civilianized version of the combat-dedicated F7A Hornet military fighter, while the Buccaneer is a civilian ship designed from the ground up for combat. The position of the Avengers, slightly below this trade-off line, hint at their other strengths. The Titan and Renegade have decent cargo holds, the Stalker contains prisoner pods, and the Warlock has EMP capabilities. The Buccaneer and Defender's elevated positions, marked with dotted arrows, placing them in fact in line with the military ships, despite ultimately being civilian ships, comes at the expense of their durability. Both ships are described as being not as durable as comparable fighters, and for this reason they are flagged in the graph as being notably vulnerable in terms of resilience relative to their neighbours in the graph. The final grouping is the military ships, which fall along the military ship trade-off line which ranges from ships exchanging agility for firepower on the right side and ships exchanging firepower for agility on the left side. These are all ships built dedicated for combat and for this reason it is unsurprising that they outperform the combat-oriented variants of civilian ships such as the 325A or civilianized military fighters like the F7C Hornet. These ships can also be subdivided according to their position along this military ship line. The more agile and less powerful ships, the Kautu Al, Gladius and Gladius Valiant, are termed light fighters and can be meaningfully compared with the albeit civilian and vulnerable hull, yet still strongly performing buccaneer and defender. The middle ground position in this trade-off is occupied by the Sabre and its variants, the Scythe and the Hurricane. And these are called medium fighters. Finally, the ships favouring firepower over agility on the right side of this trade-off line, such as the Glaive for example, are categorised as heavy fighters. Some of these military ships are also marked with a dotted arrow, as their specific features, such as EMP or stealth capabilities, are achieved at the expense of a relatively weaker position in the comparison. 
In other words, they stray down and to the left of the trade-off line. I'll now begin a detailed comparison of the ships in these different groups, starting with the starter ships and their variants. Here is the format of the detailed breakdown I will be using going forwards discussing these ship classes. The ship's firepower score is given here in bold, but their raw values for strength of guns and missiles are also given. Their agility score is also given in bold, alongside the raw values for turning speed, turning acceleration and top speed. The ship's shield score, expressed relative to the default, most common and weakest shield setup, is given in bold beneath them, with a score of 1 equaling this default setup. Finally, there are cells for keynotes, current price and availability. Ships in Star Citizen are either always available, available only during certain time-limited sales that typically occur a few times a year, available only in limited quantities, or not available at all as a backer reward uh, at present, or maybe even ever. So, looking specifically at these starter ships and their variants, it's clear that the agility score is worst in the Aurora. The Aurora MR is essentially identical to the Aurora ES. Their differing agility scores stem from their different stock equipment. The Aurora LN, on the other hand, is significantly more heavily armed than the other Aurora, and in fact, it dominates this ship class in terms of firepower. The Mustangs Alpha and Delta are the most agile ships in this class, outmaneuvering the Reliance in terms of speed and turning speed. The Reliance Decent Agility score is in fact mainly achieved through their responsive turning in terms of turning acceleration. Notably, the Reliance each have two seats in their cockpits, despite lacking any manned turrets. The Mustang Delta has two special size 1 missile mounts, carrying a bespoke load of 16 unguided rockets each. Now, while the Aurora LN scores highest in terms of firepower, it is notable that this is due to a highly respectable missile loadout. It is in fact the Reliant Tanner that has the most firepower as far as guns are concerned. Price-wise, the Mustang Delta and the Reliance cost a little bit more to backers at the moment than the Aurora and Mustang Alpha. So that was the starter ships and their variants. Now let's move on to the civilian fighters, which form a trade-off line ranging from those that are slightly more agile on the left to those that are slightly more powerful in terms of weaponry on the right. You'll notice that I haven't included the Buccaneer or the Defender in this group. I'll be bringing them up together with the light fighters instead. As mentioned, there is somewhat of a gradient where decreasing agility gives increasing firepower. This trade-off line is best fitted along a gradient from the 325A through the F7C Hornet, the Hornet Ghost, Hornet Wildfire, and then finally to the F7CM Super Hornet, with the Avengers all falling slightly below this trade-off line. The 325A is the most agile but least powerful of the ships along this gradient. Its firepower and agility score both come from a well-balanced set of values. For its class, it has a balanced but weak gun and missile loadout, but decent all-round flight abilities in terms of turning speed, turning acceleration and top speed. The civilian Hornets somewhat adhere to this line, although a couple of additional trade-offs are at play which affect their scores. First of all, the basic F7C Hornet is close to the midpoint on the chart. It has a decent loadout of guns and missiles, slightly favouring missiles, and its agility values are all decent. The F7CS Hornet Ghost retains all of these strengths but also features added stealth capabilities. The only drawback to this ship compared to the base F7C Hornet seems to be the price. The difference is not that huge. The F7C Hornet Wildfire, on the other hand, replaces the size 2 utility mount um, of the regular civilian Hornets with a turret 
packing two size 3 guns. This increases its firepower without any discernible loss of agility and puts it on par with the stronger military light fighters or the weaker military medium fighters. The F7CM Super Hornet is the closest to military design that is still legal to sell on the civilian market. Its firepower is comparable to the military medium fighters but at the expense of some manoeuvrability. Also, it's worth bearing in mind that the F7CM Super Hornet's turret requires banning. We know that the civilian Hornets are all notably durable craft and that the F7CM Super Hornet is particularly durable in this group so it makes sense to expect these ships to be the most resilient in terms of armour and structural integrity in this class. Finally, the Avengers all perform relatively similarly in terms of agility although the Titan and Renegade have an edge over the Stalker which itself has a slight advantage over the Warlock. While the only real difference in terms of the Titan and Renegade are their stock equipment, the Stalker features built-in prisoner pods and the Warlock has its added size 4 EMP weapon module which may explain its poorer agility. Price-wise, the heavier civilian Hornets, the Wildfire and Super Hornet, are significantly pricier than the other ships, with the Avengers and 325A being the lower cost option in this group. So that was the civilian fighters. Now here is the military ship line again. As I mentioned before, for this final comparison of each group, these ships can be subdivided into three groups the light, medium and heavy fighters. I'll start with the light fighters, which include the Buccaneer and Defender, despite them being civilian fighters in actuality. These ships form a relatively straightforward trade-off between agility and firepower. The Kartu Al has some exceptional flight statistics, with the highest of all top speeds in this analysis, as well as the fastest turning acceleration. You'll note that the agility score has been appended with EST stop for the Kautu Al. This indicates that it was estimated due to turning speed being a missing value from the ship matrix for this ship. I will use this terminology going forwards also where ship scores have been estimated or inferred for other ships due to missing information as discussed earlier. The Gladius and Gladius Valiant are still highly nimble fighters and while their top speed is matched by the Buccaneer, they outmaneuver the Buccaneer in other regards. In terms of weaponry, the Kautu Al is notable for not carrying any missiles. The Gladius and Gladius Valiant rely heavily on missiles and their loadouts, while the Buccaneer favours guns over missiles and the Defender wields a balanced loadout. Again, bear in mind that the Defender carries tachyon cannons, although the details surrounding these weapons are still unclear. As mentioned earlier, the Buccaneer and Defender are in fact not military vessels, yet they still compare favourably in terms of armament with the military light fighters, without sacrificing too much agility. The reason for this is their low durability. They pay the price for taking a position alongside the military ships along the military trade-off line despite only being civilian ships by being vulnerable in terms of ship resilience. The Defender attempts to cover for this somewhat with its extra small shield generator raising its shield score to 1.5 but it remains to be seen how this plays out in game. Also note that the Defender has a max crew of two despite not having any turrets. Finally in terms of price, the alien designed vessels, the Kartu Al and the Defender, are more expensive than the other ships in this class, with the, with the base Gladius being the cheapest. And that was the lighter end of the fighter line, with ships favouring agility over firepower. The next group, the medium fighters, attempt to strike a balance between these two. Again, in this group, there is a clear gradient between agility and firepower although with a slight level of complexity added. The Sabre and Sabre Comet fall slightly below the military trade-off line 
and the Sabre Raven significantly below it. This is because the Sabre and Sabre Comet, as well as being well-balanced medium fighters, also have stealth capabilities. Meanwhile, the Sabre Raven has both stealth as well as EMP capabilities. Its position below the military line can be seen as a trade-off for these extra abilities. The Raven most notably sacrifices guns in terms of firepower. Note also that all three of these ships have twice the shield output of most fighters. The Scythe and Hurricane are more straightforward trade-offs between firepower and agility, although I imagine that the Hurricane may turn out to have an inflated agility score at the expense of durability in a similar way to the Buccaneer and Defender, yet this remains to be seen. In any case, both of these ships heavily favour guns over missiles in their loadouts. The one solid agility value we have for either the Scythe or the Hurricane is the Scythe's impressively high top speed, which favourably compares to the Gladius, Gladius Valiant and Buccaneer. Note that the Hurricane has a turret that requires manning in order to function at highest efficiency. Finally, in terms of price and availability, the Raven is only purchasable in a promotion deal with Intel for one of their new SSD hard drives. The Scythe has only been sold in very limited numbers, while the Sabre, Sabre Comet and Hurricane are likely to be sold in time-limited sales going forwards, and are all of comparable prices. So those were the medium fighters. Now let's look at the last group, the heavy fighters. All ships in this class should be regarded as highly resilient, very powerful, dedicated military fighters. Again, there is a relatively straightforward trade-off between agility and firepower. This trade-off ranges from the glaive, the most agile but least powerful, through the F7A Hornet to the Vanguard Warden, the most powerful but least agile ship in both this group and in the analysis as a whole. In terms of weaponry, the Vanguard Warden loads a balanced setup between guns and missiles, while the Glaive leans towards a preference for guns, and the F7A clearly favours guns in its loadout over missiles. The Vanguard Sentinel sacrifices some of its firepower for EMP capabilities. Remember that both the Vanguard Warden and Vanguard Sentinel have a turret that requires manning. In terms of resilience, these are three fighters all likely to be very durable targets, but with the Vanguard standing out in terms of armour and or structural integrity, as well as performing very well in terms of shields, as they pack three times as much shield generation as the regular fighter. In terms of prices, the Glaive has been sold as a quantity limited ship and the F7A Hornet has yet to go on sale, if it ever will. The Vanguard's Warden and Sentinel are likely to go up for sale during one of CIG's time-limited sales going forwards. And that was the final group of ships. Here is an overview of the results once more. The chart can be adorned with these arrows pointing to the sacrifices made for added features relative one of the two identified trade-off lines. All Sabres and the Vanguard Sentinel sacrifice firepower for EMP and or stealth capabilities. The Avenger Warlock simply gains a size 4 weapon dedicated to its EMP weapon module. And the Buccaneer and Defender achieve a jump in performance at the expense of decreased durability. Hopefully this structure will help make sense of the increasingly complex patterns of variation among the ships of Star Citizen. You may have noted, incidentally, a couple of gaps along the military trade-off line. I predict that two of the coming fighter ships that we already know about, the Vandal Blade and the F-8 Lightning, will slot in neatly to bridge these gaps. The Vandal Blade is likely to be a light fighter akin to the Gladius, although presumably somewhat less well-armed, yet slightly more agile. 
while the F8 Lightning is likely going to bridge the gap in terms of firepower between the single-seater F7A Hornet and the super-heavy turreted Vanguard Warden. Time will tell if this prediction is accurate at all. I'll end this analysis with a final view of the fully annotated chart. While it's up, I'd also like to repeat one final time that dogfighting is not the total Star Citizen experience, even though it may feel like that while we wait for other aspects of the game to finish development. While it's true that an Aurora ES will struggle and almost certainly lose a dogfight against an F7A Hornet, the comparison presented here focused only on a subset of all the variation between these ships in the game. Apart from ship role aspects, such as vessels being perhaps more suitable to trade, smuggling, science, customization towards various specific roles, etc., it's also worth bearing in mind the cost, maintenance cost, and expendability of a ship. While the in-game cost of these ships is now in a way approximated by their real-world backer cost, a dedicated military fighter like the F7A Hornet is likely to be more expensive than a combat-oriented variant of a civilian ship like the 325A even in-game. In other words, I want to flag that this expendability is likely to always be a relevant aspect of ship evaluation. For example, the ship from an F7C Hornet to an F7A Hornet in this graph provides certain benefits with seemingly few or no drawbacks. But are they worth the increased cost? And how do you value the loss of the utility hardpoint, which could be used for attaching a small cargo module, for example? Hopefully, having taken all this analysis into account, you are now well armed to look at this graph and identify which ship is most suitable for you. If you want a dedicated fighter, then a ship along the military line is suitable, where you can go for the super light but nimble Kartu Al, the super heavy but clumsy Vanguard Warden, or something in between. Equally, if you'd rather have a fighter that can potentially also be used for some other purposes than dogfighting, then a ship from the civilian line is more suitable. Finally, if you're not sure that dogfighting is your thing, then you might as well hold on to your money and kick things off with one of the starter ships. Also, you'll hopefully be looking forward to my future analyses on other types of ships, such as traders, haulers, explorers and racers. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the verse.